Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a Standard Bank webinar hosted by SPFC, which is Standard Bank Financial Consultancy. My name is Ketu Ekunene. I'm the coordinator of this event. But lucky for me, not the presenter and the speaker. We've got two wonderful gentlemen to discuss that for you. We've got Mr. Errol Mayer and Mr. Neil Buertis, which I'll introduce to you in a few seconds. Just to remind you, we are discussing practical financial planning scenarios with real life events and how these can easily be mitigated. So just some housekeeping, two points from from me to you before we start. First of all, please make sure your volume is high up and you can hear me. If you can hear me, I just want to see an indication that everybody is uh, on board with the sound. There's a small high five on the panel on your right hand side of the screen. If you don't mind just clicking that high five for me, that will indicate to me that you can hear me, then we can continue. Thank you, Yashota. Thank you, Yogana. If I can just see a few more. Tiloshni, Stephen, Sos, Mbongele, Shonin. All right, all the hands are going up. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. And second point of housekeeping is questions. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can type those questions up on the very same panel under questions for us. And then what we'll do is we'll reserve the questions till the end of the presentation so the gentleman can have a smooth run and then we'll tackle those questions for you. If you do happen to think up a question when we've finished and we've logged out, you can just send me an email. There'll be a thank you note that comes out with my email address and then I'll send the gentleman the questions and then I'll send you back the answers. Hopefully that's simple enough. All right, let me introduce to you our presenters. I'll start off with Neil. Neil joined Liberty in 2008. He started his career as a broker consultant. He has since been involved in all forms of marketing and analysis, risk life benefits. He completed his postgraduate diploma in financial planning from the University of the Free State and he's currently a business development manager for Liberty's Life products. That's why he's here today. And Mr. Errol Mayer, our second panelist, our resident DJ, you know him, he's a certified financial planner and admitted advocate of the High Court SA. He holds qualifications in finance, law, teaching and taxation. He's authored a book, Notes on Estates and Financial Plans, which is now prescribed for many universities. He's a renowned lecturer, examiner and moderator for various universities in South Africa. He's previously worked as a legal advisor for corporates and a tax advocate for SARS. He currently holds the position of advisory propositions legal specialist right here at Standard Bank. So we've got a diamond in our midst and the two gentlemen will be tackling our topic today. So I'm going to close off for me for now. I'll see you at the end. I'm going to hand over to Errol who will start and then he'll hand over to Neil. Good afternoon, gentlemen, and good luck. Thank you, Kitty. Well. Good. So good day, everyone. Welcome to another one of our webinars where we once again focus on professional financial planning in a goals-based financial planning environment. Now, goals-based financial planning is nothing else than professional financial planning, an aspect that we at Standard Bank are very serious and putting the interest of our clients first. So let's see what we have on the agenda today. And then we'll get to the next slide, the Katiwe. There we go. Did you push that one? No. Okay. All right. Good. So the agenda is, uh, first of all, um, a little introduction just to set the scene. <clears throat> and then um, perhaps start off with a definition of financial planning. And then I'm going to do a short, very easy scenario planning, uh, taking a business owner and uh, see what is it that we must do to do some liquidity estate planning. And then I'm going to hand over to Neil Buertas, who's going to talk about the frequency of claims, debt, and other and various risks. Now, where do we start? For some reason, worldwide and in South Africa, goals-based financial planning is often associated with investments which are designed to meet your goals. However, that is only part of financial planning. Now, in this webinar, we will introduce you to some new concepts and explain how important it is that holistic financial planning is done. Many of your goals will not realize if you fail to have a proper understanding of protecting those goals in the event of a life, uh, life risk occurring, such as death, disability, or an illness that may deplete your savings. Stated differently, ensuring against life risk we ensure that we stay on track with our goals. As an example, assume that a person has an investment goal 
to save a future value of 500,000 in 10 years time when his children will go for tertiary education. Now the question arises, what about that goal if the person dies or is not able to work permanently or temporarily? Or what if he suffers a heart attack and his medical aid is depleted, which means that he will have to dip into extra savings. And these savings were meant for the education goal of his children. Now assume for a moment that a client dies. After two years, he's only saved 50,000 for an education goal. It would make sense to have life insurance of at least 450,000 to balance, and thereby accelerating the goal in the event of premature death. Such monies can be placed in a testamentary trust, which makes it so important to have a discussion around the last will and testament of a client. A last will and testament is therefore nothing else than a financial plan protector within the context of goals-based financial planning. It is for this reason that I refer to risk policies as goal and financial planning protectors. No proper financial planning can be done without fully understanding what holistic financial planning is all about. So let us start with a definition of financial planning before we explore the life risk principles and make use of some practical examples. So there you see <clears throat> the definition of financial planning accepted by the Financial Planning Institute, South Africa and worldwide, you'll find the definitions very, very similar. What is important is to understand that financial planning is a process. It's got a begin and an end. And in that process, the aim is to develop strategies because we all are unique and different and we all have different risk profiles. And these strategies is to assist clients in the managing their financial affairs to meet life and financial goals. And that would include such a process, reviewing all the relevant aspects of the client's current situation. That's how you marry the intermediate or outer community of property, your assets, your liabilities. And then you compare that with what the client wants. Some people are more interested in having a vacation at the age of 65 than the education of the kids and other people the other way around. But we all are unique in that respect. And then, most important, to design a plan to assist a client on this journey of financial in independence. So, usually when we start with the financial planning process, we show you the wealth quadrant. Now, the wealth quadrant should be familiar to many of you because it's nothing else than a life balance sheet. On the left hand side, you will have your assets, and on your right hand side, you will have your liabilities. So, your assets are your capability of producing an income, and that is the first block to create and build. And there you see it's a farmer, it's a salaried person. And each person will have its own unique characteristics as to how to actually build his wealth. Then also on the asset side, you'll find the passive investments as opposed to the first quadrant that could be the active side. And those passive investments should be your pension fund, your collective investments, even all your savings. The right hand side is now to give purpose, and that is your future liabilities often discounted to a present value. Now, in this particular presentation, what we're going to focus on is on the left hand side, the asset, the ability to produce an income. We always find a wealth while you're alive and up until the age of 65 and longer. But what if something happens to you that that income producing capability is taken away because of death or even disability? or even not being able to have an income for a couple of months or permanently. So, in order to overcome that, it's important to consider life cover. And life cover is in the event of my death, a capital sum will be payable, nothing prevents you from the spouse affecting life cover, and even the husband be the owner and vice versa. There are various ways that we can structure it. The reality is that life cover often is seen as a grudge payment by many people because the perception is I don't get anything back. But that's not quite true because what you get back is a peace of mind and you're giving context to the plan. 
So if you have an education goal for your child and you've contributed only the first two years, the fact that you're going to die, surely you still want your child to go to university and ATS Islam. And that's how we fill the gap. So I often find that people will use a life policy as a bonus, as inheritance, and that is actually not the point of departure. I would rather say the purpose of a life policy is to mitigate the risk and very importantly, and that's what I'll show with my scenario planning, is to place you and your family in a position so that the lifestyle is maintained, especially for the dependents who are staying behind. Let's talk about another risk, and, and that is the one about disability. Now, there are two types. There's an income disability benefit and a lump sum disability benefit. And I'm, I'm telling you this because this will position and put you in a better position to understand when you're talking about these things. Now, the first one, a disability income cover. The purpose of this one is to compensate for the loss of earnings, think the first quarter, as a result of disablement. A monthly income amount is paid where the impairment is assessed according to a scale of activities of daily living or monthly income to cover business expenses or temporary disability income that pays out for a limited period, usually 6, 12 or 24 months. Now, this monthly income is restricted to a percentage of your normal monthly income as defined in the policy and is usually 75%. And that's mainly because they don't want people to harm themselves in order to gain a financial advantage out of that. Now, in the past, some of the policy contributions were tax deductible, because you're protecting your income. But since recent tax changes, the premiums are not tax deductible and the income proceeds are then also paid tax free. So the income that you're looking at is 75%, you don't have to take tax into consideration. So that is to provide an income. What about the lump sum disability benefit? So when will one then opt for a lump sum disability benefit as opposed to an income disability benefit? Instance where an insured person becomes permanently disabled and therefore unable to work and earn an income. One is effectively replacing your income earning structure and therefore a capital replacement. The benefit is meant for capital expenditure, such as to purchase a disabled body equipment, such as a car, lift in the house, etc. However, it also serves the function to compensate for future loss of income as well as costs associated with being disabled, as alluded to above. Now, another ancillary benefit is dread disease. So, what is dread disease? Well, examples are when you suffer heart attack, cancer, stroke, coma, etc. But what is the intention? To have a windfall if one of these events occur? No, remember what I said, is to ensure that you maintain your lifestyle. And therefore, it's intended to provide for immediate expenses for best possible medical care. The originating risk is still covered with the medical aid. So this dread disease would be an additional payment for the major impact on the quality of life and future life expectancy of a policyholder. And that then gives you an indication of the ancillary benefits that we will talk about more. So let's quickly make use of a practical example. And for the purpose of my demonstration, um, I'm only going to focus on life cover, which is the most where most people are familiar with. So let's take a very simple scenario. Now let's assume daddy is a businessman whilst mommy is taking care of the children until they are ready to go to school, where after she will return to work. Let's further assume that they have two children, very young, one and two years old. It is his wish that mommy should inherit everything, except for the investments that are meant for the children's future education. But that is a wish and there is no will, which could have complications. So let's assume that he has the following assets and liabilities. The first asset would be the primary residence where they stay in. We assume the value of two and a half million and the bond would be 1.5 million. Then let's further assume that 
he bought a car and that was purchased recently. So the value is 500,000 and the liability is 500,000. He would have furniture, maybe inherited gifts up to 100,000. And then he has saved in a collective investment scheme, 1 million rand. He started the business with someone else and he's got a 50% share in the business, which is valued to 3 million. Um, and therefore he's a entrepreneur. Charges are, that a person in this position will not have a pension fund and therefore perhaps the savings, the collective investment scheme, where a salaried person will usually have a pension fund and some unapproved group life. This particular instance, he's got none. But what he started doing is to save for his two younger children and he made use of a tax-free savings account and that is the education goal. So on the face of it, things are looking pretty good for him. There is no problem provided he is alive. So in totality, his assets is substantial, 7.1 million, and the liability is 2 million. Not bad at all for a young person. But at the moment of death, there are always expenses that needs to be paid. So the first one is capital gains tax. You are deemed to have disposed of all your assets upon death. And certain assets will be excluded. In our particular example, the collective investment scheme will be subject to capital gains, and the calculation is the market value on debt, less the base cost, that would be the contributions that were made up to date, and one would calculate the capital gain, which is the difference. The same applies to the business, and I assumed that the startup of the business with 500,000 capital, and therefore there would be quite a substantial capital gain of 2.5 million. But currently, in terms of current laws, only 40% is included and 45% taxed on that 40% inclusion rate, which means for our purposes that the capital gain that must be paid upon death is 594,000, almost 600,000. Over and above that, one needs to do an estate duty calculation also upon death. So you will pay capital gains tax as well as estate duty. And how do they calculate that? Well, I'll go through this quickly. There's the primary residence, you add the car, you add the furniture, you add the collective investment, you add the 50% share of business, you list all his assets, You even the tax-free savings, which is meant for his children, is added up. And there we get the 7.1 million. But you're entitled to deduct certain things. For instance, the primary residence, the bond, of 1.5, the car of 500,000, and some of those liabilities in the estate you're entitled to deduct. There's the master's fees to wind up the estate. There are executive fees that's approximately 4% of the estate that must be paid. And then the capital gains tax that I've calculated earlier will actually qualify as a deduction then for estate duty. So the total liabilities would be 2.8 million. So if we bring that forward and we calculate the estate duty, you take the assets less the liabilities and the net estate for estate duty purposes would be 4.2 million. In terms of current legislation, you've got a 4A abatement of 3.5 million and the intention or the thinking is possibly that could be increased to 15 million in future, but we await and see if that may realize next year or thereafter. But currently, the estate subject to estate duty would be 770,000 and the estate duty payable would be 154,000. Now, this is a very simple calculation that every single person can do it as simple as that what I am doing here. And here comes the final and the most important part. And 50% of estates in South Africa suffers from this problem. So people are doing wonderful planning. But because they neglected to do a simple little exercise like what I'm doing now, all the goals are going up in smoke and that whole holistic financial plan that you've got is worthless. So a liquidity analysis will show, first of all, cash in, and that would be your collective investment. Your tax-free saving, which was meant for your children, is now going for expenses. That is 60000 And the total that you have in your state is just over a million. But you've got to pay the bond, you've got to pay the car, you've got to pay the master's fees, 
you've got to pay the executor's fees, you've got to pay SARS the capital gains tax, and you've got to pay the estate duty to SARS as well, which gives you an amount of more than 3 million, which means that this particular person, although initially it looked like a very wealthy, doing very well, lots of savings, by failing to look at the risk of something happening to him, and I only discuss death, there is actually a shortfall of 1.9 million. Now, I haven't looked at mommy, what income she's going to get, and there's ways and means, how do we go about to plan to make up for these shortfalls so that we can ensure that debts are repaid and also the state liabilities are paid and mommy is secured of income at least until the children are out of the home and where she can work or alternative plans can be made. And this is the function of a financial plan and a goals-based financial planning environment. It is where we as the financial planner, together with the client and our product providers, which you're going to hear in a moment about, is to assist you with preparing a financial plan in order for you to reach your goals and ensure that you also protect your goals. And now I hand you to Neil Buertis, who is going to tell you more and give you more detail about the risk and the payments of these risks. Thanks, Neil. Thank you so much, Errol. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity um, for being able to take you through this. So what I want to tell you is what happens to the average everyday person. On screen now, you can see how we paid out claims during 2017. Now, cardiovascular conditions and cancer made up the majority of the claims that we paid out last year. Um, you can almost draw a line in the sand that when it comes to cancer and a lady is diagnosed with cancer, it would be breast cancer, purely because it's the most often diagnosed cancer. And with men, it would be prostate, prostate cancer for the exact same reason. Um, when we look at cardiac conditions, it's normally the men, but we see a tendency where the ladies, unfortunately, are not excluded when it comes to um, heart attacks and other heart conditions. Another thing that we picked up is that 52% of motor vehicle claims came from young achievers. And again, we can make the generalization that it is young males. Um, I'm not going to explain that too much. What I do want to just position before we start um, any further is that we don't like to box clients or label clients into specific um, little compartments. We do, however, prefer to segment clients and put them in different segments. For example, we will have the young achievers, which would typically be your millennials or Generation Z um, clients. Then we have the young parents. Um, we have the we have the young parents. We have the established providers, and then we have the empty nesters. So, when we look at the motor vehicle claims and we say it's the young achievers, it would be generally be the millennials or the Generation Z clients that we have. So, when we look here, we see the split between genders, the male and the lady clients, and how we pay the claims. So, the top five causes for claims would be, like I explained, cancer, cardiovascular conditions, central nervous system and strokes, respiratory diseases and disorders, and then musculoskeletal diseases and disorders. As I explained in the previous slide, we will see that it's more often that the ladies are diagnosed with cancer than the men, where the men are more prone to be diagnosed with cardiovascular conditions than the ladies again. And then the other conditions are fairly equal, but those are the two top concerns that we have when we talk to clients Errol positions everything very clearly. So when we go into the actual recommendations, we recommend that the clients do look um, for prevention, not prevention, for um, helping them when they are diagnosed with one of those two conditions. So here we're looking at the segments. Um, just quickly with the young achievers, the top left um, graphs there. We see that the retrenchment benefits are the two ben or the benefits that we paid out the most over those um, that segment. Now, just to make it clear, this is not um, the money value of the claims, but the actual amount of claims paid. So the reason, one of the reasons, speculated why we see that the youngsters um, claim more on the retrenchment protector or retrenchment benefits 
is because they are typical millennials and Generation Zs. Um, we can look at last in, first out. We can look at um, they like to define themselves as movers and shakers. So they want to move around. Unfortunately, then the last in, first out um, a principle applies there. What is really alarming is that we see the amount of cancer claims for these youngsters. Now, cancer is not something that you would typically identify or associate with youngsters, but again, cancer doesn't discriminate against age or gender. It is equally dangerous for everybody. The young parents, um, self-explanatory, so these are youngsters or younger clients with um, children. There we see the cancer and cardiovascular conditions coming through strongly. So I just want to compare the young achiever ladies with the young parent ladies. If you look at the cancer claims, it jumped from 19% to 34%. So that is also really alarming and why we need to address these needs. So I urge you to please speak to your planner when you have a moment. The cardiovascular conditions for the men are 19%. And when you go to the next um, segment, the established provider, that's bottom left, you'll see that that 19% jumps to 26%. The cancer for the lady clients, again, very high at 37 and by far the most um, reason for claims that we paid out for those segments. And the trend continues on as we go into the next segment, the empty nesters, where we will see that the cardiovascular conditions for the ladies jump from 8% of total claims for the segment to a 16% of total claims for the segment, which is enormous. Again, even though we associate heart conditions or cardiovascular conditions more with the men of the male clients, again, the lady clients are not excluded from that. On this slide, we have the four segments again, where we look specifically at cancer. So the colors of those pie graphs there You'll see the orange would be life protection, so that would be life cover. The purple would be lifestyle protection, so that is what Errol spoke about, the dread disease cover. The light blue is loss of income protection, where we bundled the lump sum disability and the income disability into one color. And then the darker blue one there is policy protection. So what I want you to notice here is that clients diagnosed with cancer are not necessarily going to die. In today's day and age, cancer is not a death sentence anymore necessarily. We see that for the young achievers, 56% of those clients diagnosed with cancer um, had a lifestyle claim, a dread disease claim, where only 15% of them had a life claim. So the question I want to ask you is, when you survive cancer, when you go through this huge ordeal and you are a survivor, how will your life be impacted? Will you still be able to have the same lifestyle? Um, would you have had enough money for all the specialists, all the operations, if it was there? How would you fund that? Um, Errol briefly spoke about that, but that is where the dread disease cover then comes in. If we look at the young parents, only 27% of those um, clients diagnosed with cancer was life protection, death claims. The rest were survivors and we paid out either dread disease or income protection or lump sum disability cover for that. So the question I want to ask is, what happens when you survive cancer? Can you afford to survive cancer? On this slide, we look specifically at cardiovascular conditions or cardiovascular claims. And really alarming here as well. If you look at the young achievers, top left segment there, the majority of the claims we paid out was death claims, life cover claims. Now, if this was indeed a young businessman with a young family, what would happen to them if the income, the main breadwinner's income suddenly gets lost? How will that family survive? What legacy will he need to leave for them if he or she passes away? As we can see throughout, the bigger parts would be for then either the death claims or the dread disease claims. Looking at this graph, I just want to summarize all the other um, slides that we had. At the bottom, you can clearly see we have the young achievers, the young parents, established providers, and the empty nesters. And now we estimate the difference, the different life cycles or stages that they are in. So if you have a young achiever that just started out, first job, 
moving out of his parents or her parents home and something should happen how will they be able to follow that graph all the way through to go into retirement if you have a young parent again if i can make mention to what errol said are you going to use the children's education money to fund your day-to-day -day living or will you have something set separately or apart that can fund those um, expenses there same with established providers are you going to use your retirement funding in that stage of your life that was supposed to take you to your golden years to fund medical expenses and then with the empty nesters um if everything goes well as we all hope it will you will have a happy and long retirement if you made all the provisions the last slide that i'm going to take you through is just to show that the different life stages so we have the established providers and the empty nesters again I want to take uh, point your attention to the right hand side where we have the cancer and cardiovascular conditions where I just want to show you that we spoke about cancer for men majority of the claims was prostate cancer and then for the ladies the majority of the claims was for breast cancer um, coronary artery disease for the men and then myocardial infarctions which is a typical heart attack for the ladies Thank you so much, Errol, for allowing me this time. Thank you for everybody that um, tuned in. I really appreciate it. I'm handing over to Errol again. Oh, thank you, Neil. That was very insightful. If he would just help us with the questions here, but while we're waiting for that, Neil, perhaps I can ask you a question. Of course. So tell me, why is it that we see such a big increase in clients being diagnosed with cancer? Errol, the sad reality is that it boils down to lifestyle and lifestyle choices. Um, when you drive home, you're very hungry, you're tired. Instead of going and having a healthy home cooked meal, it's easier to pop into a fast food restaurant and then having something quick to eat. When we relax because of the high paced or fast paced life that we leave, uh, live, live, it is so much more relaxing to have a glass of wine than to have a glass of water. So the majority of that and um, our chief medical officer would agree that it boils down to lifestyle and lifestyle choices that we make. Okay, well then one more and then we can see there's a couple of questions coming up. Why is it so important to have disability cover? Why not only life cover? Errol, like I showed you on the graph, if we have a young client starting out, he needs to go through his whole life. Um, he needs to earn an income so that he can live, so he may can make provisions for retirement, any other events that may happen. When you are disabled, you can't earn an income anymore and you will become a burden on either your parents, family members or friends. So for me, it is out and out to have your little bit of dignity to go through life and be able to do your own thing. Okay, well, let's have a look at some of these questions here. The first one is Mapaseka. Um, she, uh, she says, good day. Please can, if possible, tackle financial planning for startup families without any excess monies available. Well, I think it would be a good start that if you start with a plan and then work on that excess. And uh, interesting enough, Neil and myself had a discussion. I mean, excess is a very subjective, um, you know, the way of looking at it. Uh, who says there is an excess? And Neil actually mentioned the word priorities, if I remember correctly. So it's about priorities. And a lot depends also on your values. What is important to you is education. I spoke about that. Education, is it a vacation? So if education is more important or medical is more important, then prioritize accordingly. And therefore, any excess somehow will be available to do the or give um, effect to that financial plan and then we've got uh Nati asking one um let me move it up a little bit this one could be for you yeah cuban is asking here can one take out a disability cover and dread disease cover only without taking life cover in any product offering. In other words, can it be loose standing? Indeed, indeed it can. So like Errol said, it can be a loose standing or as we also refer to it, a non-accelerating benefit. So yes, you can indeed take disability and or dread disease without having to take life cover. Okay, good. Then Nati is asking, asking here, 
high circumventing the musculoskeletal diseases and disorders and cardiovascular conditions is a matter of lifestyle habits. It can be, yes, absolutely. Um, lifestyle, we can look at non-professional sports people people like to uh, people that like to play hockey or rugby or cricket or soccer over the weekends so absolutely it can contribute to that um but unfortunately genetics also play a role and there are certain instances where it won't be lifestyle but as long as the client is not a professional sports person we won't discriminate okay well that makes sense um ricardo is asking what plan do you suggest for our lower income client? Well, I think I've answered that previously. Um, you know what, so maybe I can say this, w when we deal with uh, financial planning, people tend to think about the assets and liabilities and surely that is a factor. But really what it's about, financial planning is about family, irrespective of the amount of income, is what you want and the goals that you set for yourselves. And therefore, the financial assets and the liabilities that you have is only part of the whole exercise. Um, and then there's here's someone, um, Peter, does disability jet disease pay out when you don't claim? Does disability jet disease pay out when you don't claim? I'm not sure what is quite meant by that, but Obviously, you've got a claim, you've got a contract. In terms of the contract, um, then one is entitled. So I'm not quite sure what was meant there. It's, do you I think what he tried to how ask? I can try to explain it. It's just, it would be the same example as short-term insurance. So if you have short-term insurance on your car, if you do not bump the car and do not claim to have it repaired, it will not pay out. If you do not become disabled or are diagnosed with a new disease, it will not pay out. Okay, then I saw a question. Let me just scroll up. There was a smart question. Johanna Dunn. Johanna, hello. Is there not a capital gain tax deduction of 300,000 a death? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I, I simplified it. It's actually not a deduction. It's an exclusion uh, that one would qualify for before you actually uh, calculate the tax. So it's, it's not a massive amount. It's very little but I try to keep things very simple. So a matter of fact, uh, other aspects of whatever you bequeath to your spouse, that will also qualify as a state deduction and roll over the leave. But I, I didn't show that, I showed the worst case scenario. And as a matter of fact, if you don't have liquidity in a state, you lose a lot of those capital gains rollover benefits. So I try to, to make it as simple as possible. Um, then let's see if there's some anything else. Um, that, that one. Okay, let's see if there's one more. Um, someone is asking here, uh, Manny, surely there is a formula on how much life cover to take, depending on income and expenses. I find this is to be such a hit and miss with brokers it all depends on the risk that you have identified but i think one must also realize that life cover is not an it is not an inheritance technically speaking yeah it's to provide an income stream for the spouse but that's why we've got the concept in law of insurable interest so you can't insure someone's life and turn this into a wagering or betting contract that when he dies you're going to get a lot of money so there are limitations it starts with the insurable interest and that relates also to how much income and that was exactly what i discussed with the disability i mean um disability is limited and that's why even in life insurance you will find interesting enough that you cannot insure a child's life more than a certain amount uh, because of the risk uh, attached to it um, and that people will do wrong things in order to get access to funds. But uh, there's no definite formula, and I think this is what you were, were, were talking about. Uh, yes, Ruan Janssen van Rensburg, does the life cover not increase executive's fees? Yes, absolutely. If the, the funds are paid to an estate, then it will increase the executive's fees because the executive will be paid on whatever he's dealing with in the estate. Um, interesting here too, what lots of 
or I see advice doing the rounds and say, but let's nominate someone else as the beneficiary, then we avoid the executor's fees. Be very careful where you want that money to land up because you may be saving on the executor's fees, but the cash flows in the estate will have unintended consequences. Perhaps what you should do is calculate say, how much are the executor's fees? Is that in line with the services rendered? Because if you've got a liquid estate and very little, surely that you can beforehand agree and say that you will wind up my estate for X amount. And I know some of the trust companies are doing, are doing that. So yes, you are correct. It will increase, but there are many ways to go about that. Um, and then there was waiting for the name. What percentage of your estate? Uh, it is 3.5% and you add on VAT, which was 14%, so it was less than 4% in total, but VAT has increased to 15%, so I think it's about 4.03, it's somewhere around there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and that that is about that is about it. Uh, let's see if I missed anything else. And yes, maybe one for Neil. Uh, Ramachandra says, do we have to take life cover and funeral cover as both are paid on death and both taking cover is beneficial? So I think funeral cover is exactly for that. It is meant to cover the cost of a funeral. Um, and then life cover could have other purposes, um, bequeath, bequeathing money to a miner, which will help the miner go through their life stages, um, just buy shares in a business. So yes, I think there's definitely space for purchasing both on the same policy. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Thank you, you gentlemen. Very informative. I learned a lot as well. I hope everybody learned. Um, there were some questions there about will the session be recorded? Yes, it is recorded. There will be a thank you note that comes out in about two days with the link for the Standard Bank YouTube channel where you can catch the recording of this session as well as all the previous webinars that we have done. We do post them on that uh, Standard Bank YouTube channel. And if you do seek further advice, financial planning advice, please don't hesitate talking to any Standard Bank branch. There is financial planners in all the branches and they can assist you with those queries. Or if you just wait for the thank you note, there's a number which you can SMS or call and a financial planner or advisor will phone you and you can set up an appointment. Hope that makes sense to everybody. We will see you on the next webinar, which is next month. We have one of these once a month some people are asking are there more yes there is once a month we have a webinar so you can catch an invite closer to the time thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i hope you have a good afternoon and we'll see you next time